Well, so all right, guys, let's start. It's time. Thanks again uh, for visiting us for today's meeting. As we promised, we, have, uh, we planned initially to conduct uh, our webinars more frequently, and we are moving in this area, in this way, and working on it. Okay, so today we will talk about uh, very interesting things related to the nut based recovery. And uh, most of you guys maybe already know me and Roman, but just a few words about us. My name is Max Petitsev. I am Chief Commercial Officer at Ace Lab, and I am staying with Ace Lab for more than seven years. I'm responsible for sales, for the partnership with the marketing activities, and help people to stay in the right direction to equip the data recovery in digital forensic laboratories. And with us is Roman Morozov, uh, who is the head of training and technical support department. He has been working at Ace Lab for more than 10 years, and he's a highly experienced guy, especially in the NAND-based and SSD recovery. And today he will tell us very interesting things in technical ways how to cook NAND-based storage media. And uh, you know, sooner or later, most of us, or some of us who are already dealing with the HDD recovery, come to the decision to provide some extra service like NAND based SSD recovery in order to provide the full range of services for the data recovery labs. And uh, today is a good opportunity to talk about uh, Flash and to talk about how to make the recovery of Flash more easily and efficiently. And uh, I just want to mention a few words about uh, our company. Most of you guys are very familiar with Ace Lab. Some of us, some of you guys are just uh, staying with us today for the first time. All right, so uh, we are a very uh, quite old company for more than 29 years. And uh, we supply our solutions around the globe for more than 120 countries. And um, a lot of customers uh, worldwide, south end of customers, are uh, using our equipment. And uh, our staff is mainly consists of the scientists, uh, scientists and mathematicians, and we're proud of it because it helps us to use scientific-based approach when we develop our new technologies and help you to get to extract data, uh, to extract data on the intelligent way. And uh, it's very important uh, when you're planning, when you're uh, just thinking about flash recovery, to keep in mind some important point, some important areas. The first area, uh, the first point is uh, to study the local market and to understand the demand for flash cases in your area and plus understand what are the average cost of flash cases. And it will help you to make final decision whether it's profitable for yourself to deal with flash or not. The next uh, point is to choose reliable source of information and to use appropriate technologies to succeed in this area. And of course, the third uh, point is to analyze common mistakes in flash data recovery and try to avoid them. And today, uh, Roman will tell us more about uh, this moment. And another moment is uh, uh, to be highly experienced in this area and usually training courses, uh, training courses of yourself, for yourself or for your staff is very crucial if you want to succeed in fl with flash cases. And um, of course, the main point, the main moment, the basic, you know, is to choose the best tools for flash data recovery because your tool should be, at the same time, it should be very flexible in order to deal with the quite very complicated cases. And at the same time, it should be easy to use and uh, to deal with like one click solutions and uh, not to spend a lot of time and a lot of efforts. And plus, you should have uh, be able when you deal with some of the product to have an excellent technical support. Because sometimes, even if you highly experienced guy, maybe you have some troubles, or maybe you need some extra development for specifically for your case. And technical support is very important. And uh, all of these three criteria gives you uh, an opportunity to provide the maximum success rate of flash recovery. Okay, so uh, what is scheduled for today? First of all, we will talk about differences in recovering data from flash and HDDs. After that, we will talk about non-flash drive structure. Plus, uh, next, Roman tell us a bit about bit errors and the main reasons of it. And uh, he will also tell us about data encryption and will show some real life cases. 
And as for now, I would like to pass my word to Roman. Uh, welcome everyone to our technical part of presentation and today we are going to speak about flash recovery market, about flash recoveries and we are going to discuss about the main problems that usually arise when we are dealing with flat drives. Before we start, I just want to tell you a few words about our uh, schedule for today. So first of all, uh, we are going to spend around maybe uh one hour and 30 minutes during our technical presentation during this presentation we are going to discuss some theoretical parts and of course then we will uh, uh show you some interesting practice cases that probably will be a little bit or probably not a little bit interesting for you and uh, please uh, don't forget that uh, we are going to show the most interesting things about pc3000 flash during our april conference we are going to announce it very soon and we are going to present our plan for this uh, meeting uh, very, very soon in nearest uh, week. So please uh, keep watch our news. And of course, uh, we prepare a lot of interesting things during our large April conference. That's why the material that I'm going to share with you right now will be not so unique. Probably some of you, if you uh, experience engineer, most of the topics would be well known, but anyway, we think that it's always good to refresh your knowledge, to refresh your mind, and to remind you some interesting and probably useful things about flash data recovery. So I hope that you will enjoy our presentation, and don't forget that if you will have any questions, you can leave them by the link that our uh, moderators uh, leave for you in chat. So please follow it, uh, leave your questions there, and in the end of uh, our session we are going to discuss uh, your questions and we are going to provide you an answers so let's move ahead <clears throat> first of all when we talk about when we talk about the flash recovery we should keep in mind that we are not going to speak about mobile phones and ssd drives why because uh, all these types usb flash sticks sd cards ssd drives and mobile phones they are based on the same nand memory chips so why we should exclude SSD and mobile phones from the flash recovery? The main idea is that uh, mobile phones and SSD drives, modern models, they contain a full hardware encryption. And it's a real problem, because if you will try to make a chip off, you will see that all data will be encrypted. And we are using another approach. We are not using the chip off approach when we are dealing with modern SSDs and mobile phones. And we have some other tools like PC3000 SSD to deal with solid state drives and we have PC3000 mobile to deal with mobile phones, even encrypted mobile phones. So uh, during my speech, I'm not going to uh, work and I'm not going to speak about mobile phones and SSD. So we should focus on classic storage devices like USB sticks, like memory sticks, like micro SD cards, SD cards, and CF compact flash cards. It's a classic storage devices that you usually can find in uh, digital cameras, in uh, daily uh, working, um, your daily uh, working, yes, yeah, so uh, probably uh, you storing some information your, on your USB keys, on your USB flash sticks. It's a standard and classic flash storage devices. Uh, which usually never use a full headway encryption in comparing with mobile phones and SSD. So uh, that's why when we comparing the technology of flash recovery and hard disk drive, we should remember that, of course, classic HDD might be presented in several, um, in several, uh, let's say, in several forms. Yes. Yeah? So some hard disk drive might be presented like an internal hard disk drive in your desktop, for example, like 3.5 inches drive. Some of them might be based on a small portable devices with USB interface. And of course, some of them might be uh, a part of a complex RAID arrays, which combine a lot of hard disk drive inside. And uh, when we're comparing the uh, classic hard disk drive recovery and flash recovery, we should keep in mind that, of course, hard disk drive contains much more complex internal structure than the flat drive. And if we will start to comparing it, we can find that classic hard disk drive also contains a heads, it contains a moving parts, it contains a very uh, complex internal structure. And of course, uh, when you are dealing with hard disk drive, you should prepare your lab for that and you should invest a lot of money into 
equ uh, into a good uh, tools and equipment. For example, if we talk about hard disk recovery, we usually should keep in mind that we need to buy a clean box for opening the hard disk drive or for storing the heads. We should buy a special uh, tools for heads changing. We, had, we have to buy a special ultrasonic bathes for platters cleaning. So we have to invest a lot of money for equipment. But when you are dealing with flat drives, the only things that you should have just a, a cheap soldering station with hot air gun and with uh, solder iron, minimal number of different tools and instruments like scalpel, tweezers, some flux, alcohol, spirit, and so on. And of course, you need to use a computer, a powerful PC. Not probably as powerful as described at this slide, because you can see that it contains uh, two graphical cards, contains a lot of leads. So it's pretty cool gaming PC, but I am talking about not such good computer. Uh, system requirements for flash recovery uh, ask you to buy a computer with at least Ryzen AMD Ryzen 5 or Core i5 CPU with 16 GB of RAM. This CPU will be enough to deal with flash devices. We found that some Customers uh, who start to work with flash uh, recovery, they using the same computers that they use for hard disk drive recovery. And of course, if we comparing the requirements for HDD recovery tools and for flash recovery tools, we can find a huge difference because for hard disk drive, you don't need to use a powerful computer. You just need to have a lot of storage space to storing the data resources and so on, but you don't need to have a very powerful CPU on it, a lot of RAM, because Express and UDMA uh, are not so... ...requirements and they do not require a very powerful PC. But when we are working with flash recoveries, we are using a special mathematical algorithms, we are fixing the bit errors, we are doing the rereading, we are doing some raw recovery, file covering, and of course, these procedures require a pretty uh, good computer. So uh, we recommend not to use all core to do a CPU or probably all Core i5 CPU. We recommend you to use processors, which were released after 2015, 2016. It's a pretty good computers uh, that you can use for even for the large recovery cases with 128 gigabyte, with 256 gigabyte and so on. So, um, when you are dealing with flat drives, you don't need to use a clean box because uh, the chip that you will uh, do a chip off, that you will unsolder, uh, might be uh, inserted into adapter without the clean room. It's not a problem. You shouldn't invest into very specific tools like donors. You shouldn't invest into heads, into the PCBs because it's uh, useless. The only thing you have to do just to make chip off, read the dump, and then use the software to build the image from the flash device. So this is pretty um, easy way to start your own flash data recovery business because it requires much less investment in comparing with HDD. At the same time, of course, we understand that if we comparing the flash market and hard disk drive market, we can find that uh, the percentage of HDD is around maybe 70%, while the flat drive is around 30%. Mm, so 70% for HDD, 30 for flat drive. Yeah, of course, we can get much more money if we will start our HDD recovery business. But at the same time, HDD recovery business requires much more investment in comparing with flash recovery, which doesn't require too many tools. And uh, also, very interesting things that you should keep in mind. Uh, when you starting to work with PC4000 Flash, with Flash Recovery, you can find that sometimes Flash Recovery might be a little bit more complex than HDD Recovery, than a typical HDD case recovery. And sometimes you have to spend a lot of time on uh, some procedures which requires the uh, rereading, for example, ECC or uh, XOR elimination or mix elimination and so on. But at the same time, uh, most of these um, uh, options, most of these steps that you are doing in PC3000 Flash are, optimi uh, um, are optimized. It means that uh, you shouldn't spend too much time on them. And uh, 
you shouldn't be near your computer when for example ecc correction is going or you shouldn't uh take your time when uh, you you shouldn't busy your time when you are doing a rereading when you are fixing the errors you can drink a coffee you can uh, switch uh, your attention to some other cases, it's not a problem because PC4000 Flash is a highly optimized tool where most of the processes might be done in the background. So you are dealing with other cases while the PC4000 Flash is fixing your data. But again, of course, uh, some cases requires a really lot of time. We get some new flash drives which requires approximately four, five, six, seven days for error correction because they contain a very bad NAND memory chips and of course they require a lot of passes of corrections. So that's why you should be ready to wait before all um, steps would be done and you will be able to start the uh, data saving from the recovered flash drive. And uh, of course we should speak about the NAND flash drive structure. I know that most of you already know how the flash drive is working, but for beginners I just want to remind a few things. First of all, of course, all flash drives work absolutely the same. It doesn't uh, matter what type of flash device do you have. It might be a digital card, it might be USB flash stick, it might be SSD drive. All of them are using the same internal structure. They have an interface, they have a controller, and they have a NAND memory chips where all important information like service area, like firmware are located. And of course, NAND memory chips contains the user data, but this user data is not visible for us because this data is mixed, it's rotated, it's recorded into different places. And of course, when we try to read the information from NAND memory chip, we can see that it's not the same data as we wrote through the interface because this data is seriously, seriously mixed. So uh, this is another example. This is a flat drive with USB stick and here we can read some information from this drive. For example, this drive is based on USB connection on USB interface. Also, this drive is based on uh, Elcor microcontroller 6988. It's a pretty good controller, pretty popular controller, and most of the valuable, entirely um, value uh, uh, drives uh, with USB 2.0 interface are based on this controller. And of course, here we can see the TSOP48 memory, where we can see 24 legs from both sides of the uh, chip, so totally 48 legs. That's why it's called TSOP48, so 48 contacts. And when we're starting to uh, write the data, all data is going to be written through the controller. And of course, controller mix the data, it changes the data, it's uh, writing the data into different places inside the NAND memory chip. And our main goal, try to understand how a controller wrote the data on the NAND memory, then we need to reconstruct the steps that controller did with data into reverse mode. In this case, it will be possible to get the same data, the same regular data that our customer previously recorded at our drive. And uh, of course, there might be different types of flash devices. Oh, previously, I show you on the previous slide, I show you a classic flash drive where we have a controller, USB interface and NAND memory chip with external components and in the left part of the screen right, right now you can see another type which called a monolithic device or monolith device uh, where all components are highly integrated and they're joined all together. For example, you can see here that there is no extended controller, there is no extended chip, extended NAND memory chip, there is no the PCB all components is just a one piece of silicon with highly integrated components inside. So how you can uh, read the memory chip, how you can do a chip off. In this case, of course, it will be not possible to do because uh, there is no extended components and you can't just make a chip off from this case. Because again, chip is inside the layer, the ceramic layer inside the monolith. But we can try to find some specific outputs on the back side of the monolith, we can uh, try to erase the, copper, uh, the uh, protective layer, the compound layer from the monolith, 
we can try to find the layout and with the help of special adapter we can try to read the NAND memory chip. All other steps would be absolutely the same as for a classic flash device with extended memory chip. For example, uh, here you can see that uh, PC4000 flash support almost all existing types of the NAND memory chips and we found that right now we can work with 90% of all memory chips which exist in the world. There are also some uh, very rare types that you can find only in SSD market, like for example BJ316 or BJ224. It's still possible to read these chips using our multi-board adapter, but you will need to solder a little bit, or with multi-board where you don't need to do any soldering operations. But the main idea is that it's still possible to get a pretty good reading result using one of our compatible adapter. And we, as I said before, support more than 90% of all existed NAND memory chip on the market and we can read them pretty well. Right now, I am not talking about the eMMC chips because for eMMC chips, we are using our another tool, PC4000 Mobile, which can handle with encryption, which can handle with uh, modern operating system like Android and so on. So uh, we're not going uh, to discuss about the e eMMC during my speech. So uh, now let's talk about the internal structure of the NAND memory chip, how the NAND memory chip is working. Actually, it's working pretty simply. If we will start to uh, research how the NAND memory chip is working, we can find that all NAND memory chips consist of a small, small cells. These cells wor works like a small capacitors and usually these capacitors are very extremely small and they divide it between each other with special isolation, isolation border. And uh, if cell doesn't contain any charge, it's empty and it would be interpreted like logical zero. So the controller read information from this cell like empty cell zero. If there is a charge inside this cell, it will be interpreted like logical one. So it's a binary mathematic and controller know about it, how it's working and it able to write down necessary information about uh, the data inside the cells. Another interesting thing is that when we are reading information, we are using a small voltage, 3.3 volts. But if we want to write something on flash drive, if we want to erase some information or rewrite the information, we should send much higher voltage, like 12 volts. And of course, when we're sending such a high voltage, there uh, uh, become a degradation of isolytic borders between the cells. And it means that all NAND memory chips have a limited life cycle. We can rewrite them only a few times. And after that, the charge anymore because charge is flued away. That, uh, that's why uh, uh, manufacturers decided to uh, add some tricks inside the internal structure of the NAND memory. And they decided to add and create some new technologies to keep more data inside the flash drives and make them uh, cheaper. So in 2005-2007, uh, the first companies start to produce the NAND memory chips. Uh, which were based on SLC technology. SLC cell. If there is no uh, any charge, uh, the cell contains zero. If the cell contains a charge, it contains logical one. So it's very easy to calculate what type of data is inside. But after some time, manufacturer decided to add more data inside one cell and they decided to use MLC chips, like multi-level cells chips. And usually such chips, uh, which were started to produce in 2010, 2011, are able to store two bits of information. Right now, MLC chips contains the highest uh, quality rate between all existing types of the NAND memory chips. It means that uh, right now, if you'll go in the market and you will try to find the uh, most expensive and the most highest quality solid state drive, most likely it would be an SSD with MLC memory chips. As I remember correctly, just one company at this moment produce, still produce SSD based on MLC chip. It's a Samsung company and they produce some models like 
uh, Pro modifications like 860 Pro, like 970 Pro, not like Evo because Evo use another technology, but Pro. They still use MLC technology in their memory chips. Also, Apple computers, they also use MLC technology to uh, keep their devices to be very highly quality and uh, to protect the data leakage and uh, data corruption inside their drives. In 2012, Toshiba and SanDisk start to produce the TLC memory chips. Right now, it's the most typical and the most popular type of the NAND memory, where manufacturer can store three bits of information. And when this type of memory chip appears on the market, we found that uh, these memory chips contains a very, very bad internal quality. And of course, uh, during the time, the data on these memory chips start to degrade, it start to become worse and worse, become bad, and it's a real disaster. And right now, most of the flat drives that you can meet in the market are using the TLC technology. And finally, in the end of 2018, a Samsung company decided to start production of QLC memory. And they released some new solid state drives, which were called Samsung 860 Cubo. These drives were based on QLC memory chips. They were amazingly cheap. For example, one terabyte SSD drive will cost less than $100. So it was very, very cheap SSD. At the same time, the quality of this drive was amazingly low. Now, because from one side, of course, the data compression inside the cell allow us to store more information. But from another side, uh, there is a high chance to read wrong information. Because if you put one level of charge inside the cell, but for some reason you read wrong level of cell, you get a bit error. And there is a very high chance to catch this bad, um, uh, bad byte error bit error when you are reading the cell like QLC or TLC. And now at this graph you can see uh, how the quality and price become lower and at the same time uh, capacity become uh, higher. And uh, you can see that unfortunately modern TLC and QLC chips contains a very, very and amazingly high capacity. For example, TLC chip can store around 128 gigabytes of information in one uh, chip enable, in one ceramic layer. But uh, the whole chip might contain one terabyte of information inside. If we talk about QLC, they are using a very high compressed data technology and they can store around one terabyte of information in one chip enable. And uh, of course, when we speak about the newer generation of NAT memory chips, at the same time, we can see that the number of possible writing cycle goes down and the quality also goes down. For example, for SLC chips, we can see that we can rewrite the data thousands of times. If we talk about the MLC, probably we can rewrite the data 200 times, uh, 2000 times, 3000 times, and after that, the cells start to degrade. The number of errors will grow up. If we talk about the modern TLC memory chips, the number of rewriting cycles become even less. It become around from 90 in the first generation of TLC till 50 or even 10 if we talk about the latest modification of TLC chips. If we talk about the QLC, the QLC memory chips contains a very, very low quality. And of course, it's uh, necessary to write it just a few times before the NAND memory chip stopped working correctly. We get some experiment. We bought a new flat drive with QLC memory chip, and we tried to write it from the beginning till the end. And we found that when we write the information two times from the beginning till the end, the number of errors become so high that it was not possible to open any working file. All data become destroyed, all files become damaged by bad sectors. This is a modern situation with QLC. Sometimes it's still possible to use different techniques to reread the bad sectors. But in most of cases, unfortunately, even uh, if they are pretty new, even if customer didn't uh, rewrite the memory chip too often, it's a real problem to recover data from modern QLC chips. Lucky for us, QLC memory chips are still not very popular, but of course their number is growing up every year. And uh, ASLAB developed different techniques, how we can improve the quality of reading, how we can 
uh, develop a new read retries mode to influence on the cells by different voltage and read the best possible quality data. So um, we talk about the NAND memory chip quality. Now let me talk about the bit errors, because the quality uh, becomes the main reason why bit errors appears on the NAND memory chips. At this slide you can see two pictures. The first one is original image, which is pretty good. You can see that it's solid-state drive based on Fizen controller, uh, based on some TSOP memory chips. It's pretty good. But from another side of this slide you can see the same image but with bit errors. You can see that it covers by different colored lines. Unfortunately, this image can't be opened correctly. Some bytes inside this flash, inside this picture become damaged and of course it's not possible to uh, see the full content of this file. It's partially damaged. And usually when you are dealing with flash drives, you will get such situation very, very often because most of the data which is located on the memory chip will be like that, with bit errors. That's why it's very important to fix the bit errors when you start to work with data recovery from flat drive. And sometimes this procedure requires uh, pretty a lot of time and pretty a lot of resources of your computer. And we are going to speak about just a little bit later. So, uh, why do the bit errors appear on the NAND memory chips? What is the main reason? We talk about different generations of the memory chips, of course, and now you understand that if we are speaking about the latest modification of NAND memory chips like TLC, QLC, we have just a limited writing um, write cycles on the NAND memory chip, and the new modification of NAND have a very bad quality. Another problem is uh, that manufacturers to compress the crystals and to produce more crystals with NAND memory chips, they are using a small technological process. If we talk about MLC chips, usually they use uh, maybe 32 nanometers, 45 nanometers to produce the NAND memory chip. But if we talk about the TLC and QLC, most of the manufacturers prefer to use very thin uh, technological process like 10 nanometers, like 14 nanometers, 19 nanometers, and of course uh, all this uh, smaller size of isolation border of cells become the reason of data degradation and cells corruption. Uh, another problem is a charge leakage from the cell, and we are going to speak about it. And of course uh, we should remember about damages inside the special uh, temperature voltage table, which is located inside the modern NAND memory chip. Let's talk about the charge leakage more detail. Actually, uh, it's very uh, funny because uh, we know that if we write some information on the hard disk drive and we'll put the hard disk drive on a shelf, we might be at 100% sure that 10 years after, if we'll take this hard disk drive, data will be still there. But unfortunately, this is not working for the flash-based devices because modern solid-state drives and modern flash devices have a very, very weak NAND memory chips. And we found that if you will write down the data on the flash drive and you will decide not to connect the flash drive to your computer and charge it, yeah, so uh, put the charge on the buffers, data start to degradate and the charge inside the cell start to flood away. After approximately uh, 10 weeks, if you will not touch your modern flash drive, you can find that uh, some files might become covered by bad sectors. So previously working file become unworkable. If you will wait approximately a, a half of year, you will find that sometimes even a folders become corrupted and some partition information also become lost. If you will leave it for two years, I'm sure that you will find that your flash drive will become absolutely clean without any data, because the leakage of the charge inside the cells. Imagine that you have a phone where uh, you fully charge the battery. If you will switch off this phone and you will put it into your table and you will switch it on after approximately one month, you will see that uh, you don't have 100% uh, of the charge anymore, because uh, most likely that battery start to discharge just a little bit. 
The same thing happens with the modern memory chips because they losing their uh, voltage inside the cells. The charge become fluid away after some time. If you do not use your flash drive, if you do not connect it to your USB computer, USB port into your computer. And sometimes uh, we get uh, a lot of cases from accounting department when uh, some lady from accounting department can store the backup, the important backup information on the flash drive. She put it into, she put the flash drive stick into safe box and when for some reason their company lose important data, she uh, take this flash drive and plug it to your uh, to, to her computer and she can find that unfortunately most of data become damaged. Why? Because the charge leakage, because she didn't plug the flash drive back to computer uh, too often and uh, cells start to discharge. Unfortunately, it's a real problem. That's why if you're storing something on your SSD drive, into your laptop, into your modern flash drive, uh, don't forget to use it more often because less you are using it, less you are reading the cells, then more chance to lose the data. Another interesting thing uh, which might be a real issue and might cause the bit errors is a temperature voltage table degradation. All NAND memory chips contain a small mask table which is located somewhere near the buffers. The main idea is that, uh, uh, of course, inside the NAND memory chips you will never find this table, it not looks like this one. We just uh, create some description and we try to explain how it's working. But of course, it's not look like this. It's not look like a real table. Yeah, so um, I'm, just go I'm just going to say that uh, let's imagine that this table looks like this. And all NAND memory chips, they have a special thermo sensor which can get information about the outside temperature. This outside temperature tells the memory chip which voltage NAND memory chip should use to read and write the data correctly from the NAND memory chip. Because if the outside temperature is very small, uh, we need to use smaller voltage to read the correct data. If the outside temperature is high, we need to use higher voltage to read the NAND memory cells without um, let's say, without losing the original values of the charge which was inside these memory chips. But during the uh, technological process, during the bad quality of the NAND memory chips, sometimes there might be a shift between the values. And you can face with this situation when uh, memory chips start to send a wrong voltage instead of a correct one. And there might become a shift between values. So SSD drives start to, or NAND memory chip or flash controller, start to think that memory chip outside temperature is too cold, for example, and it's sending lower voltage instead higher voltage. And we get a problem. So how we can uh, solve this issue in the NAND memory chips? Because sometimes we're trying to fix the ECC, we get a lot of errors. We're trying to read the memory chip and we get a lot of problem with memory chip reading. We don't get the original data from cells because they return back to us a wrong values. How we can deal with it? We have uh, two options. We can try to use voltage, so we can try to increase the voltage or we can drop the voltage to be able to read the correct data or we can try to use temperature. We can try to hit the NAND memory chip or we can freeze the NAND memory chip. So how it's working? Uh, at this slide you can see one example. So in the left part of the screen we have a small TSOP memory chip with the radiator on it which we're trying to hit with the solder iron. We do not use a very high temperature. We are using just a small temperature right uh, like around maybe plus 80 plus plus y 100 but this temperature is more than enough to hit the NAND memory chip and to get a good result of memory chip reading. Sometimes if the wheel is become shifted into another side here yeah, we need to freeze the NAND memory chip and for doing that we also can use uh, a special uh, freeze spray. We can freeze the NAND memory chip, we can blow it with a freeze spray and after that, 
internal temperature of the NAT memory chip become lower and this table shift become eliminated and memory chip start to return us a correct data, a correct fixed data without bit errors or at least with smaller number of errors than it was before. By the way, this technique you can use also for uh, SSD drives when you are working with faulty SSD drives which are not supported by our equipment. Try to freeze them, try to uh, hit the NAND memory chip, sometimes it really works. And of course, there might be some additional issues like uh, bent chip or damaged pins because sometimes when the NAND memory chip is located on the PCB and someone try to bend the PCB trying to uh, screw it a little bit so the pins might become disconnected and NAND memory chip also might become damaged. That's why it's very important to uh, look into the NAND memory chip and try to find do we have any corruptions, do we have any troubles with the crystal of memory chip or not. If we don't have it's okay, if we have it so we need to be very attentively probably we have to spend some more time for correct memory chip reconstruction. Another thing is a memory chip unsoldering because sometimes when you are hitting the NAND memory chip you can overheat it. That's why most of the forensic companies who deal in with mobile phones, they are not using a hot air gun for chip off. They are using a special polishing method, polishing procedure, which allows to erase the bottom side of the PCB, reach the NAND memory chip and just read it without any problem. So they do not, um, they do not uh, desolder it. They can polish it or they can cut it with the help of a uh, special very sharp and hot knife. Uh, this is uh, also very important information. So our recommendation, if you are going to start your data recovery business, uh, don't pay too much attention for soldering equipment because uh, the best uh, tool right now uh, for most of the cases, of course, not for all cases, but for most of cases is a hot air gun station. You can uh, set the temperature between 300 and 360 degrees by, by Celsius and spend around one and a half, two minutes for unsoldering chip method. And it will provide you the best result between quality and between the number of errors and between the time that you spend for your chip. And be um, um, don't worry, you're not going to overheat the NAT memory chip if you will do it fast and if you will use not extremely high temperature like more than 400 degree. So what about the data encryption? I know that data encryption is a real disaster right now and most of the data recovery companies meet the encrypted devices regularly. But how the things are inside the flash devices? Do we have any difference in comparing with hard disk drive? And I can say that yes. Uh, lucky for us, uh, there might be just three types of encryption. The first one is a hardware encryption by flash controller, which is used inside the flash device. We can say that right now encrypted controllers are pretty, pretty rare because uh, encryption requires a pretty large and complex internal crystal of the uh, flash controller and most of the manufacturers does not want to pay a lot of money for developing such controllers. So they do not use it and most of them are still using normal controllers without hardware encryption. We found that uh, two controllers like Fizen, like uh, Fizen 2251.13 and SanDisk 8200.4.10 generation, they are using a hardware encryption and right now our developers are working under the way how to decrypt the data and how to emulate controller to decrypt the data using the keys on the NAND memory chip surface. Another type of encryption is a software encryption like a bit locker protection, like a file vault, like a true crypt and so on. Such encryption is pretty uh, often might be used for solid state drive, for hard disk drive, but not for flash sticks. I can uh, say that honestly we get just a few cases per whole year from all over the world. Our technical support department help for a lot of different uh, countries and a lot of different customers worldwide. But we didn't get too many of flash sticks with BitLocker, maybe two, maybe three per year. So it's not a high rate. And of course, if the data is uh, 
encrypted with a BitLocker, we have some algorithms how we can use PC4000 flash to reconstruct the image and then extract the complete image into a binary file, then uh, use data extractor to unlock it. But of course, if we talk about the BitLocker encryption, you should remember that we need a recovery key or we need a real password which customer used to protect his BitLocker key. Without BitLocker key, unfortunately, right now, our equipment can't recover data. But as I said before, <coughs> situation when we get the BitLocker case is pretty rare. And finally, of course, we get a light encryption, which called XOR. Actually, XOR is a special mathematical operation which uh, encrypt the data, which put the pattern on data. It's not a full hardware encryption, it's just um, uh, scrambling the data, but it looks like encryption. If you look into the master boot record without encryption, without XOR, we can find that inside the MBR we are able to read information about invalid partition table, error loading operation system, missing operation system. Usually you can see this message when your hard disk drive don't want to boot the window and you see the back, uh, black screen with this message. At the same time, if we will try to put the XOR on the same MBR sector, we can see that data becomes scrambled and it looks like encrypted because there is no uh, empty places, any zeros, uh, all data filled by some content by some data and of course this data is scrambled information we can't use it without the XOR and uh, the main idea is that more and more manufacturers release new types of XOR every month and of course uh, we faced with the new types of XOR, uh, XOR encryption very very often sometimes it become possible to uh, decrypt the XOR and uh, find the solution. Sometimes, but not very often, uh, it's temporarily not possible. But I want to say that ASLAB PC4000 Flash contains the largest database of available resources. And we upload the new memory chips ID, we upload the new ECC codes, we upload the new uh, XOR parameters into our database into our PC3000 database every week. So if you keep your PC4000 flash up to date, you will be able to recover the highest range of different storage devices, even if they are based on the latest modification of flash controller with the latest source. Okay. Now let's uh, uh, speak about the time. You know that uh, when you're working with uh, flash drive, uh, you should spend some time for recovery. And as I said before, uh, sometimes you have to spend much more time for flash stick recovery than you can spend for hard disk drive recovery. And this problem usually connected with the rereading, the error fixing, which usually takes a lot of time. Uh, the first stage, the image reading, the dump reading from memory chip, usually takes just approximately 5 or 10 percent of your time when you are dealing with flash recovery. Then you have to fix the ECC codes and for doing that you need a powerful CPU, as I said before. So better to use more logical threads, better to use more cores if you are able to buy Ryzen 9 with 16 cores or Core i9 CPU, it's good because you can save your time. But Generally, the most largest uh, part of time you have to spend on a rereading of bad, uh, bad sectors of bad areas of the NAND memory chip. And this process does not depend on your hardware system, it doesn't depend on the software version that you're using, it doesn't depend on uh, how many cores of CPU do you have. It depends on the memory chip, and if the NAND memory chip is not in a good shape, the rereading option will take a lot of time to be reread. Sometimes it might be a minute, sometimes it might be hours, sometimes it might be even days. So you should be ready for that. And the smallest amount of time that you usually spend for flash recovery is just an image assembling. Because image assembling, if you have enough knowledge, if you know how to work with this flash device, will not take too much time from you. Most of the time you will spend for error correction because error correction is 
really important thing and without error correction it's not uh, make sense to start image assembling all data will be destroyed all files will be damaged and uh, when we speak about the pc 4000 flash tool i can say that it's a really great tool for those who are dealing with flash devices as i said before we support the widest number of different memory chips different vendors different capacities qlc tlc all types we have a regularly updated resources database with the new source memory chips ecc and so on we have a highest range of supported controllers and supported algorithms so uh, you will be sure that if a slab can't recover any other tool couldn't recover this case too also we have a lot of uh, automatical automatically uh, recovery ways which allows you to launch automatic process wait some time and get the result of course it's not working with 100 percent of cases but some cases you can uh, do automatically without spending too many time for researching how the flat drive is working and how you need to reconstruct the image and finally of course uh, it's not um, enough it's not enough just to have uh, a good equipment because you need to get a get um, you need to get a good technical support service and aslab pay a lot of attention for technical support and we provide our help for customers uh, remote help with the help of team Uber. and if you stuck with some case if you don't know which step you have to do you can ask our team and we will guide you uh, our technical support team um, consists of a few engineers uh, we have uh, around 12 engineers in technical support uh, in both departments and we are glad to help you all the time when you are working with different types of storage devices. I'm not talking about the flat drives or uh, hard disk drive. I'm also talking about the SAS drives, about the SSD drives, about the mobile phone. So if you have a real case, if you're stuck with it, don't be afraid. Ask our engineers and our guys will help you. They will guide you. Also uh now let's talk about the uh, step that you are going to do when you are starting to do a flash recovery first of all when you start to work with your flash drive do the chip off yeah as i said before use different equipment to do that after you should read the damp you need to make a full image of the memory chip and save it into your computer then you need to fix the ecc error correction codes you need to apply it and do the rereading the next step will be step number four you should try to find automatical solution because as i said before sometimes in approximately 40 50 percent of cases it's possible to solve the task automatically you shouldn't spend a lot of time for manual recovery because you can start the button search solution find compatible solution and apply the steps for data recovery and finally if you still does not satisfy it with the result that you get you can ask technical support engineer in technical support department in aslab to help you to do that uh, the only thing that you need to do just make a ticket uh, ask our engineers and we will guide you so remotely with the help of team viewer we are able to help you we are able to uh, try to find some missed resources or reconstruct the image if for some reason uh, you were not able to do that and uh, how our engineers exactly can help you we can help you to add missed resources like for example if there is no such chip id our engineers our developers can help you to find the correct parameters uh, we can also try to help you find a good reading algorithm to read the bad areas we can help you with manual recovery if automatical solutions doesn't work we can help you to improve the existing uh, image that you already built if some folders or important file are missed you can ask our engineers and we will guide you and of course we have an extra feature in case if there is no xor uh, there is no uh, such type of xor encryption in, uh, in your case but uh, we see we see that it's still possible to extract the xor we can ask you to upload your task into our ftp server and our developers will help you to extract the xor for your task we don't need any donors filled by pattern we don't need any 
Other things, we just need your tasks. So you upload it to us, we extract the dump, we try to find uh, XOR, and then we show you the solution how to solve this task, and we send the solution for you. It's very important to remember that this procedure is absolutely um, uh, absolutely um, confidential. It's absolutely safe for you. We usually ask to put the password protection on the R RAR archive, so zip archive that you're uploading into FTP and share the password uh, via the ticket. So uh, don't be afraid, your data will never be leaked and uh, it not be used for any other um, uh, any other ways but XOR extraction and your case recovery just for you. And uh, of course, uh, PC for Southend might be useful for digital forensic expert uh, who want to recover data from completely erased flight drive where the data has been erased, but uh, it's still interesting what might be still inside the flight drive even if it was erased or rewritten. Uh, rewritten. And also it's possible to uh, get information from an address space inside the NAND memory chip. So we can find out uh, some reserved block, we can extract information from them, and sometimes these un um, unlocated blocks, unaddressed blocks, still might have very interesting information inside, and we can help you to find this interesting information. So, uh, let's talk about the real-life cases. Today I am prepare a few cases that I am going to show you. And again, please uh, forgive us because we are not going to show you something um, extraordinary because uh, we keep all the most interesting things to our April conference. And of course, uh, during the April conference, we are going to show you um, our interesting tasks and our in interesting cases. For now, probably for those of you who take a part into our previous April conference or who have enough experience with PC4000 Flash, these topics might be not so exciting. But anyway, we recommend you to watch it because uh, sometimes even if you know this information, it's always uh, good to refresh your knowledge, to refresh your mind and help us to remind you how to deal with different problems. And the first uh, things that I'm going to show you, how you can fix the errors inside the NAND memory chips, how you can do that. So let me open the task. Let me open the task and uh, I'm going to start it again. So I'm going to choose my drive and I'm going to choose the flat drive that I'm going to show you. So uh, we have the NAND memory chip. We already read this NAND memory chip from the flash memory and we already copy the dump of the memory chip to our computer. So our computer already contains the NAND memory chip image. What we need to do right now? First of all, we need to add the transformation graph like that. And we need to find the ECC correction code to fix the errors which appears at this dump at this memory chip. Let me show you the capacity of this drive. And we can see that capacity of this drive is around 4 gigabytes. So this is a, a modern MLC memory chip with a small capacity with just 4 gigabytes. But it doesn't matter that it's an MLC chip because most likely that even the MLC chip will contain a lot of a lot of bit errors. So how we can fix them at least partially? How we can do that? For doing that, we need to launch the ECC correction. So we are going to launch data correction via ECC and start the ECC after detection. It takes time to find the ECC codes because when we start the ECC after detection, our software trying to analyze the first blocks inside the dump. Sometimes if these blocks are empty, if the flat drive, for example, uh, not covered by data completely, it's not fully uh, written by data, it might require some additional time before the ECC uh, will be found. That's why we have to wait a little bit and be patient. Another thing is that uh, the speed of ECC detection depends on how many bit errors do we have, 
how many data we have on our flash drive. But I can say that if it's possible to detect the ECC, you will be able to find it within one or two minutes. If you still can't find the ECC during one hour or during a half an hour, it doesn't make sense to wait more because most likely that you have to do some extra steps before the ECC will be visible and before you will be able to fix the errors which appears at your flight drive. So the procedure is almost done, let's wait more. And um, when this procedure will be over, we will see the message that fast ECC searching analysis is complete. Do we want to execute full analysis? And of course we should press yes, because we need to uh, scan the whole dump and find some other blocks which might include the ECC codes. And we get the message, Perform a full analysis? Yes, we need to do that. I press the button and after a short period of time, we can see that ECC has been found. So I press yes, I would like to execute it. And you can see that right now, almost all data, almost all pages are read. They are not fixed. Some of them pretty rarely could be fixed, could be fixed partially. Some of them could be green, it means that they fix completely, but 99% of data still damaged, still red. Also, you can see that my computer is using Core i5 CPU with eight logical threads, and uh, all threads are loaded at 100%. That's why my recommendation, when you are dealing with the ECC codes, when you are dealing with the ECC correction, use the largest amount of cores that you can get. Ryzen 9, Core i9, Core i7 CPU, even a Xeon CPU, Intel Xeon or AMD Threadripper will be a great opportunity for you to fix the errors using the CPU cores. And <clears throat> again, uh, don't forget that, uh, yes, sometimes ECC takes some minutes to be corrected, even some hours sometimes, but it's still not the largest part of time that you have to spend for error correction because the longest part is the rereading, the reading of bad sectors. So uh, how we can do the rereading in this case? How we can do that? We can do it pretty easily uh, for uh, fixing the sectors that were not fixed before with ECC. We can try to build a map of uh, bad sectors and then we can start the rereading with voltage influence, for example. Let me try to do that. We have a special option, complex operation, uh, create a submap and reread. So I'm pressing it. And here I've got a message. I've got a screen where I can see uh, some settings that I have to set. And uh, you can see that we are using from one till three attempts to read the same sector, read it again from the NAND memory chip. We are using the default voltage supply 3.3 volts, but at the same time, we can try to use not default 3.3 volts, but automatically detectable voltage. And if I set the after selection of power supply and press supply, sometimes we can uh, find the good voltage uh, voltage is um, the lowest and the highest and read the data using different voltages. Sometimes it really helps to fix a lot of data, a lot of sectors. Unfortunately, in this case, you can see that most of the data is still not possible to fix by rereading. We get some positive result for some pages. We get some positive uh, rereading result. You can see that sometimes with 2.4 volts instead 3.3 volts, we can reread and get a good sector, but this result is still pretty bad. That's why we can stop this procedure, launch this operation one more time, and uh, try the read-retry. It's some kind of a special read-retry method which allows the memory chip to fix itself. Because as I said before, memory chip contains a special voltage table which allows to find the best voltage parameters to read damaged cells one more time. And unfortunately, this read retry command is not available for current chip. We can't apply it. 
But we have an option to find the most compatible read retry from the database of read retry options. That's why we recommend you to uh, update your database, to update your resources database and keep your read retry database up to date. Uh, if your database is up to date, if you are using the latest version of PC4000 Flash, most likely that you will find the most compatible read retry algorithm for this chip. How we can do that? We need to press on more button and choose read retry mode checking as soon as i launch it our software trying to apply the read retry methods in the background uh, find the most compatible and in the end when the procedure of scanning will be over we will get some result or probably will not get it so let's see uh, one of the most interesting thing is that uh, Sometimes it requires some time before a read retry option would be found. But for this chip, it's a micron chip, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, we just need to wait a couple of seconds and the most compatible read retry type 1 for micron and Intel chip has become found. So let's select it and use this read retry table to fix the errors using different voltages. So I press it. Now the read retry option become available for me. And I can start the reading procedure one more time. And now if we do everything correctly. Okay, so probably I have to start it one more time. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, working like that because uh, we are using the voltages and we have to try maybe a couple of times before it will work. Because it's a uh, modern NAND memory chips with a bad uh, quality, with a bad quality. So we have to uh, uh, try one more time. And let's go one more time to create submap and read using this same read retry option. And let's try again. So we're using read retry type number one. Okay, so, uh, and again. Modern NAND memory chips, they have uh, different types of read retries. And actually, um, every manufacturer who dealing with the NAND memory chips can use its own read retry methods. And sometimes uh, memory chips, like in uh, my example, they uh, can be not supported the read retry. And we can try to use not original read retry, but sometimes it might not work. Anyway, let me try one once again. So we are using the read retry option. We're trying to read the bad sectors. And right now it's working much better than before. So you can see that uh, right now when we are doing the rereading, we found the compatible table, the compatible read retry table, and we rereading the bad sector one more time. Here you can see uh, the status of sectors inside the page. So previously all sectors inside the page were not fixed. Sometimes they were fixed partially. So minus means not fixed, plus means it, it's correct. But after we implement the read retry, we get a pretty good rereading algorithm and we get <clears throat> a pretty good reading result. So everything become green. And now we can leave this procedure for rereading for a couple of uh, minutes, a couple of hours. And after that, we will get, we should get a good result. But uh, I want to warn you that uh, most likely that if you will not complete the uh, rereading option, if you will not uh, go forward with the rereading, most likely that the data will be damaged. And uh, I've got the same case. Uh, on my hard disk drive and I want to show you how the data looks like if we didn't spend enough time for a reading and if we didn't find a good reading algorithm. Here we get some steps that we did to eliminate the mix with data and now we can launch the raw recovery of file carving. When we started you can see that uh, most of the data is red, it's not working and unfortunately if I will try to open any picture, like for example, that one, yeah, so it's a pretty large picture. I'm trying to open it and I've got 
different image artifacts. This is the bit errors. And of course, before I fix the errors, it will be impossible to get a complete image and get a complete recovery. At the same time, if, <clears throat> if I will do a rereading, if I will be able to uh, get the good um, uh, image, the good quality damp, I would be able to find a pretty good pictures with a pretty large size like this, yeah? So, uh, three megabyte picture and it's pretty good. We can open it, we can see the details of this picture and there is no any artifacts inside the image. This is how the read retry is working. In the end of this, uh, in the end of this transformation, we can also build the image and we can get the folder structure. In this case, unfortunately, we didn't build the image using the translator because we don't have it, but we use a block number. Unfortunately, root structure has become loose, um, has become lost, but I've got uh, a compatible copy of it, so I can try to upload the uh, good root copy into the image and be able to recover data. At the same time, you can see that unfortunately block number is not uh, always good because some files and some folders might still be read, still not openable because we have a problem of translator. And uh, right now we are going to speak about this problem more detail. Just uh, after uh, a small part about the unaddressed allocated space. So, uh, I show you how we can fix the errors, how we can find the compatible read retry, and how we can get the best quality result of reading. Don't forget that if a read retry does not help you, if voltage does not help you, you always can try to hit the NAND memory chip, or you can freeze it. Sometimes it really helps. Now let's talk about the non-addressed area inside the NAND mem memory chip. Here is a fully healthy and workable flash device in ideal mode. We get a NAND memory chip interface, everything works perfectly. If we'll try to uh, research the, the NAND memory chip, we can find that the real capacity of NAND memory chip is always bigger than capacity which is written on the case, like we never get eight gigabyte flash drive inside eight gigab inside eight gigabyte memory chip because inside we can find nine gigabyte and this <coughs> memory chip usually contains data blocks which contains a user data and which are visible for user and reserve block which use which usually are used for relocated sectors for storing some firmware storing some microcode storing some important model structures and so on some important information which uh, important for controller for the cpu inside this flat drive uh, and again data block are visible for user reserve block are not visible for us when the flat drive start to working after some time some blocks might start to degradate they still contains the data, but controller can try to reallocate it. So it can exchange the place of reserve block and bad block and put the good block inside the uh, data area, while the bad block will be moved into reserve position. But please note that this block number 002, the dead 002 block still contains user data maybe some old copies, maybe some old pictures, maybe some old files. And of course, the capacity of block usually is not very high, around one or two megabyte, but reserved areas still might have very interesting and important information inside. So, uh, now let's imagine the situation when customer or some criminal decided to erase his flash drive because he want to delete all evidence from his flash device. When he erased the data block and when they um, when he completely uh, removed the data from it or probably rewrite it by any other data of course the data block will lose any information from them while the reserve block will still contains the data some old data and we can try to use this information to get some old records about files or probably old copy of files which were recorded inside this flash drive and how we can 
uh, get this data. If we will do a chip off and if we will try to reconstruct the image using the PC 4000 flash, we are going to be <clears throat> able to read the whole capacity of the NAND memory chip. Data block, reserve block, relocated block, all blocks would be read. But at the same time, uh, how we can understand where the good blocks are, where the relocated blocks are. And for doing that, we can try to build the image and we can try to sort good blocks in one place and reserve block into another place, which might be very, very useful for us. And if we will build the image using the translator, we will include only good logical data block inside the image, while the reserve block, which might still have user data, will be uh, not included into the image. And we can very um, fast to build the special submap, find these blocks and use them. This is how the method is working. And again, this reserve block might, might be uh, might, might contain old versions of the file system, old versions of files. It might contain a pieces of firmware, translator tables, and so on. But these blocks might be very interesting for forensic research. Right now, let me show you how I'm going to uh, do that and how I'm going to find a good, um, a good information inside, and useful information inside the translator. So I've got here a SanDisk microSD card and I built a translator for SanDisk card. So let me uh, try to open it one more time. <coughs> uh, this uh, microSD card was read without any problem with the help of Spiderboard. After that, we reconstruct the image and we are able to get the information about the folder structure. This folder structure contains information only about good blocks, only about data blocks. And if I will select the translator, and if I will try to build the tools and map of unused blocks, I would be able to get approximately four gigabyte of unused space. I would like to, uh, to remind you that this microSD is 16 gigabyte. But real capacity of this drive is around maybe 18, maybe 19 gigabyte. And almost four gigabyte are relocated sectors, reserved sectors, and sectors with firmware. So we can try to save the whole dump of this unlocated area into one file and research it with the help of special forensic tools. Or we can try to launch the raw recovery like that and try to find some files inside. I already did the raw recovery here and I found a lot of file uh, structures, a lot of uh, previously recorded file uh, records about the file system, about the content which were placed inside this flat drive. If I will, for example, uh, select some FAT, uh, FAT folder structure, I can see the metadata of this FIT folder. And here I've got uh, information about the file name that was recorded here. I've got information about the date of file creation. So I can prove that this flat drive contains special files. Unfortunately, these files in this case are <clears throat> already disappeared. They are gone. And we can't recover these files, but we still can recover records that these files were there. Sometimes, as I said before, it's even possible to recover the data even if a um, flat drive has been erased. So some parts of information like small pictures or probably old documents or copy of documents might be inside the reserve block. And information from a reserve block, from like relocated blocks still might be recovered even if the flat drive has been security erased or format or completely rewritten. This is how our method is working and some other files description we can find inside every of this FIT structure. Might be useful. Okay. And uh, the last part of my technical presentation will be about the translator. 
about the image assembling by translator, how uh, it's working and why it's very important. First of all, we should know that uh, when we write some information via the interface to the NAND memory chips, like for example, this paint, this image, we write it like a piece of a file, like a large file. But unfortunately, controller RAM is very small and controller can't write such a large file inside the NAND memory chip from the beginning till the end. That's why usually controller can split the image by small parts, by small blocks, by small pages, and put this information inside the NAND memory chip. Of course, this information become mixed. This information might be encrypted by XOR. Uh, there might be some additional mixes, but the main idea is that we can't see original image anymore. At the same time, when we are reading the image from the NAND memory chip, we get a mass of blocks and mass of pages which are mixed with each other. And unfortunately, it's not easy to find a good image uh, from these pieces, from these small bricks. That's why before we will see a complete folder structure, before we will see a complete image structure, a complete uh, folder structure, we have to find the algorithm which will help us to assemble all these small blocks into one large image, into one large piece of data. And of course, translator assembling algorithm can help us to do that. And uh, today we are going to speak about the SanDisk controller, which our developers research and where we found a good translator algorithm, which allow us to find out how we can sort all blocks together and how we can reconstruct the image. The first uh, feature of a SanDisk controller is that the SanDisk controllers are very, very complex. They are extremely complex. I know that SanDisk-based drives are very popular worldwide. You can find them in Europe, you can find them in USA, you can find it in North America, in South America, you can find it everywhere. All canton, uh, continents, all areas, all regions have the SanDisk cases because SanDisk company is a pretty large company. Uh, it belongs to Western Digital now, so you can imagine how large is it and how uh, powerful is it. That's why they produce a lot of different devices and sell it worldwide. And uh, we found that all SanDisk cases are very uh, and extremely complex. First of all, modern SanDisk cases are writing data into SLC cache uh, on TLC and MLC memory. It helped to write the data faster than on TLC and MLC. And this cache is usually using for storing the file system and the most recent data. Also, SanDisk is using a special sub-blocks, a small blocks to update the file system and to renew the information about the content which is located inside the flash drive. If we talk about the video recovery, which was, uh, which was uh, written uh, into the NAND memory chip inside the SanDisk case, we can find that usually these videos become fragmented into a small pieces, and these pieces are located into different areas, into different parts of the memory chip. And of course, they are seriously connected with file system. So if we can't find a good file system using, for example, block number image building, it will be impossible to recover videos even from raw recovery. Finally, if we talk about the image assembling method and if we talk about the image assembling algorithms, uh, the main idea is that our universal way of image building using the block number will help us to build the images only with 64 gigabyte capacity, not larger. Less? Yeah, it's still possible, but not larger. The main problem is that all data uh, remain to be mm, really um, fragmented and uh, usually SanDisk are using two bytes of marker and we just can't to address more capacity than 64 gigabyte. That's why if you get 128 gigabyte you will not be able to build the image using the universal block number algorithm. You need a translator and our developers did a great job and they did it. They developed a universal translator which can work with some of SanDisk cases right now but during our April conference, we are going to announce a new version of PC for South and Flash, where developers will add more translator and more ensemble algorithms for different type of SanDisk cases, not 
um, probably just a SanDisk, but some other two. Um, and how the translator is working. Our algorithm of translator searching can try to find a special table inside the NAND memory chip, decrypt it using some additional XOR and find out what is the sequence of block placement inside the logical image of the NAND memory chip. So we can use this information to reconstruct and rebuild the image from the damaged and faulty NAND memory chip. And um, right now, let me show you the difference between translator algorithm and between the block number algorithm. I've tried to assemble the same um, image using two ways. The first one was image building using block number. And you can see that in this case, I was succeed and I was able to get even a folder structure. But this slide drive is not 64 or 128 gigabyte capacity. It's just 16 gigabyte capacity. So it's very simple. At the same time, two folders are still damaged and I can't see the content inside these folders. If I will try to expand the folder structure, most likely that I will not found the most recent files because they are located into additional blocks somewhere in the image. And unfortunately, it will be not possible to get a complete recovery. But if I will try to launch the translator assembling algorithm from extensions, we support a lot of different modern case. We support a lot of different old controllers and all cases so we can find a good translator algorithm. And with the good translator algorithm, we can try to recreate the original sequence of block and finally rebuild the image. And now I am starting the image building. So process takes some time. Let's wait. And finally, when all um, assembling procedures would be complete, we will see a translator version where all folders and all files will be green. Even the previously not working folder right now is fully working. We can find pictures, we can find information about this data. We can try to open it, we can try to save it. So everything works pretty good. And now when we get this image, we can try to uh, export it into a file or we can export it into another drive or we can just simply save the root information into our local computer into our local hard disk drive so with the translator uh, we can get a very very exact and very good result of recovery when we are dealing with flash devices and as i said before pc 4000 flash contains the largest number of different translators for different controller modifications um, if we compare it with other tools. So uh, let me sum up our information for today. First of all, uh, when you start to deal with flat drives, you should keep in mind that you shouldn't spend too many uh, money into the equipment. You shouldn't spend a lot of money for equipment and for your laboratory. The only things that you have to uh, buy a good computer and a small number of different um, tools like uh, tweezers, like scalpel, like uh, hot air gun station, and that's all. This is the minimal requirements for starting your flash data recovery business. Another thing is that uh, NAND memory chips, the modern NAND memory chips, have a very, very bad quality. That's why when you're starting to work with flash drive, especially if it contains a lot of megabytes inside, uh, a huge capacity, I mean, you should be uh, ready and you should warn your customer that probably recovery will take several days or probably uh, a couple of weeks because, again, some very bad quality NAND memory chips have to be rereading very, very slowly. And from our side, unfortunately, it's not possible to increase the speed of this process. Most of the cases still possible to uh, recover very fast using the reading algorithm and the procedure will go pretty, pretty fast. And uh, after a few hours, you will get a good image. But again, if we talk about the high capacity TLC and QLC chips, most likely that you will have to spend more time with them. Also, please don't forget to keep your PC 4000 flash resources database up to date. It's very important. 
If you will not update your resources, you might lose very important XOR and you will not be able to recover the data. We update the resources database regular, so don't be afraid and use it. Finally, you can use our uh, PC4000 Flash Solution Center, so you can use it to uh, apply automatic solution and get a pretty good result of automatic recovery. Uh, I've got here uh, one interesting task, and uh, here I'm going to search the solution. Of course, uh, it's very important to fix the ECC errors, it's very important to read the bad areas, and only after that you will be able to implement solution. Otherwise, most likely that the most data will be damaged or ruined by bit errors if you will not do that. So, how we can do that? We can try to make a right click on the chips and press search solution. And we'll try to find out the uh, most compatible solution with the same controller with the same NAND memory chip. And after that, uh, it will download this solution and you will be able to apply one of them. For example, let's choose this one and let's try to reproduce this solution. I press just one button, execute or execute in graph. And after that, our software will do automatic steps for XOR decryption, for mix elimination and for image building. And with only one button uh, step, you will be able to get a pretty good folder structure result and you will be able to recover information with automatic way, uh, like that, when you apply the solution. And uh, finally, uh, please don't be afraid to use ASLAB Technical Support Department Service, because we are always open for you, and we are always ready to help you with the most complex cases. If you don't have XOR, or if your memory chip is not supported, you can always ask us, and our engineers will check it. If it's possible, we will help you to add the required resources, extract the XOR, or add a new memory chip into database. Uh, this is the steps that you should keep in mind when you start your business and we are, when you are working with PC4000 flash equipment. Thank you very much for your attention. In case if you have any questions, please uh, write down them into our chat special form. And right now I'm going to give a word to Max. So, Roman, thank you very much uh, for this excellent webinar. I'm sure a lot of guys appreciate this uh, valuable information. And, uh, okay, guys, so as you can see, as you can see, this specific without flash tool is pretty flexible and at the same time, it's pretty convenient when you have to deal with one click solutions. And uh, it helps you to deal with a different uh, level of uh, difficulty uh, in terms of uh, flash cases. And uh, I'm sure you will uh, appreciate this and you, you understood how it happens, how it might be useful. Plus, you know, uh, just for your information, recently we announced, I'm sure uh, you're already familiar with this information, but uh, just in case, we recently announced that we have online training types for HDD, for Flash and for RAID. And uh, for those of you uh, guys who just want to become more professional, who become wants to become more experienced in flash recovery, you are welcome to join to our online training course. It's a pretty amazing course and not, uh, not standard because it's uh, conducted in the format of virtual training class where an instructor keeps control uh, for every student and guide every student uh, appropriately. And uh, it's very efficient. It lasts only one day. Uh, but it's very, uh, we had a lot of feedback from our students who already visited this training type and found it extremely useful. Right now, our moderators, uh, Irina, uh, will uh, send you the email uh, which you can use for getting in touch with our training coordinator. Don't hesitate. And uh, plus, uh, just uh, again for information, don't forget to use our free helpful online resources. Uh, it's like a uh, blog, uh, which tends, is uh, full of a lot of uh, useful articles, forum, video, YouTube video channel, and uh, our global solution-based center for flash recovery. Uh, later on, you can also find this link in our chat room. And uh, just uh, keep in mind that everything is possible. You can become really experienced 
guy in flash data recovery, staying with ASLAB, using PC 3000 tools. And uh, don't forget this information.